Praise God. If you have your Bibles, please. I want you to open up to the Gospel of St. John. St. John chapter 1, verse 43. Hallelujah. How many want to be, how many want to be uh, used by the, by the Lord? Amen. In these last days? I do. I want to be used by God. Hallelujah. Starting with verse 43 in John, the Gospel of John. The Bible says that the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee. And he findeth Philip and said unto him, follow me. Now, he didn't beg. He didn't use psychology. He didn't use man-made methods. He just said the simple statement, follow me. Follow me. Now it was up and... It was up to the person to make that decision and determination to follow the Lord. It was up to the person to either say yes or no. God will never break your arm. But he may put you in circumstances that are a little difficult. And the reason why we're in those circumstances is because the Lord is asking us to do something and we're not doing it. Amen? Next verse. Now Philip was of Bethsaida and the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Very interesting here. I want you to understand and to know that some people say, Oh, well, that's the Old Testament. Hello? John is referring to the Old Testament. I believe there's a lot of false teachers out there teaching that we don't need the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. Yes, we are. We're not under the law. But the validity of the Old Testament and the Scriptures, they validify Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did right. He's in there. If you have spiritual receptive antennas to perceive him there. It's not an Old Testament. That means that it's no longer in any use. It's still in use. He said, did write Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Next verse. And Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? I have heard so many people say that nothing's going to happen in New Bedford. Can any good thing come out of New Bedford? New Bedford has one of the highest teenage pregnancies in all the country, under 18. New Bedford has been escalated as one of the most violent cities in the state of Massachusetts. The heroin and drugs in, in the city of New Bedford is at its highest level. Gangs, shootings, robbery. Can anything good come out of New Bedford? And I want to answer that question and say, absolutely yes. And you know what that good thing is? You. 
My Bible says one will put a thousand to flight and two will put ten thousand to flight. It's what you do with what God has given you. See, God didn't just give you uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit just so that you can go in your little closet and raise your hands and weep and cry and speak in tongues. That's not why God gave the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, and it was accompanied by something. It was accompanied by what the Lord Jesus had said, that you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. And I want you to know that there's so much fire that is missing in the church today. When I say it's missing in the church, I mean it's missing in its people. And last Sunday when we were in uh, Baton Rouge, we were at Pastor uh, Diamond's church, and a woman that was in her 70s, she got up and she testified. And she said, I want to encourage you people, I want to encourage you, don't let anyone steal your fire. Don't let your fire go out. Protect it with everything that is within you. Keep the fire burning. Don't lose your fire. I almost jumped out of my seat. 70 years old. We've lost our fire. And he said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And, and, and you shall be witnesses of me. When we stand before God, we're going to say, oh God, I was living in a godless uh, city. And he's going to say, what did you do about it? You are the light of the world. A light is not hidden under the bed or a bushel. He said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Can there anything good come out of New Bedford? Oh, these people, you don't understand. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Yes, they do. There are some that want Jesus. There are some who will play, a, play the game. But there are those that are hungry and those that are hurting and those that are desperate and they need something. They've been going through this time in their life in New Bedford, I'm telling you, of despair and despondency. They don't know where their food's coming from. They don't know if they're going to be able to live in the same place anymore. And we have the answer. Where's your fire? I'll tell you, whenever there's a fire in your neighborhood, whenever you're sleeping and you hear fire trucks, what happens? What do you do? Come on, what do you do? You get up and you look. And if you see a fire, you get dressed and you go outside and you want to get closer. Can I tell you, that's what this new Bedford needs. They need some people that will be on fire for Jesus that will uh, begin to attract the people. Fire attracts. But where's your fire? We become like the dead denomination, some of the Pentecostal churches. I'm not just talking about New Bedford, I'm talking about in general. We sing songs hardly with any energy. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. Well, if you keep singing that, and who's going to want to be attracted to you? I don't want what that person's got. I don't want it jumping on me. Oh, but we could go in the world. And we can go to nightclubs or we can go to concerts or we can go to jazz festivals or we can go out there and we can go to a ball game and we can get all excited and fired up and we can stand up in front of the TV. Yeah! Yeah! But to stand up for Jesus, make a sound for Jesus, begin to praise Jesus, worship Jesus... Thank you, Jesus. Come on. 
Can anything good come out of New Bedford? Yes, it can be you. It can be me. But it's going to take more than psychology. It's going to take more than just our everyday talking to people. We've got to ask the God to rebaptize with the fire. We need the fire. You know what happens? Someone was to take a flamethrower behind you and <laughs> towards you, what are you going to do? You're going to try to get out there as fast as you can. My prayer for all of you this week is going to be, Lord, light a fire under them so hot that they can't sit still. Light a fire under them, God, so that they'll be opening their mouths and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only on evangelism on Thursdays, please, give me a break. But they'll be able to witness for you and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can go forth and do what Jesus said. He said, go forth and lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. Go cast out devils, they'll, they'll be cast out. Well, I've got to wait for the pastor. No, you don't have to wait for me. You have the Holy Ghost, you have the power. Praise the God, hallelujah. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I like what Philip said. <laughs> Come see. Come see. I'm sick and tired of the ne negative attitude. It's f There's a cloud over New Bedford. I don't know if you realize that. There's a deep cloud over New Bedford. And it's time for that cloud to move. It's time for that cloud to back away from New Bedford. And... We're going to be held responsible for allowing the cloud. We need to get out there and make a difference. He said, come and see. Jesus wants you to come and see. Come and see. I'll show you. Come, come see. You want to see me move? I want to see you move. I want to go to a healing service. No, don't go to a healing service. Why do you want to see God move among Christians? Wouldn't there be something, you go to your neighbor, and they're, and they're hurting, and they're in pain, and, and they just had, uh, they're going to have an operation, something, and you lay hands on them, and God heals them supernaturally. Hello? Praise God. I've been, I've been praying for somebody all week. And when they come here, God's going to heal them. Oh, I know the minds are turning, but pastor, you have a cold. How can you pray for healing? That doesn't matter. I'm not the healer. God is, and that doesn't mean that because I'm not healed of my cold that God is not a healer. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise him when I'm sick. I'm going to praise him when I'm healthy. I'm going to praise him all, all the time. I'm going to worship him and serve him. I don't care if I'm sick. Now, if I'm that bad and I can't get out of bed, I'll still praise him. I don't know, maybe not praise him as loud or as often. I'll just praise him and go back to sleep. Come and see. Next verse. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Wow. What a testimony he had. Wow. Verse 48. Nathanael said unto him, How do you know me? Can I tell you, some people think, well, you know what? If I get out of New Bedford and I get somewhere else, that's going to make the difference. No, it won't. Trust me, I did it years ago. I left New Bedford, went somewhere else. God says, you belong back there. I was miserable. I lived in Virginia, lived in Pennsylvania, lived in New Jersey. I was miserable. Because God has a plan back here. And as much as I hate it, are you hearing me? Listen to these words. I do not want to be here. In my flesh, I don't want to be here. 
But God wants me here. As long as God wants me here, I'm here. And I'm not kicking and screaming. I've gotten over that a long time ago. But Nathaniel said, where do you know me? How do you know me? God knows who you are. God knows you're rising up and you're sitting down, you're laying down and you're rising up. He knows everything about you. Everything. So you know what? So, you know, some people, they, they stop going to church because they're not living right. And they think God can't see them. He, he sees you right where you are. Doesn't make a difference. Doesn't make no difference. And guess what? You know the greatest thing about it is? He still loves you. Isn't that awesome? He still loves you. He still loves me. I know I ran away from God one time. I was like Jonah. I went all the way down to Virginia. God said, nope. Almost got killed too. Oh yeah, I had a Jonah experience. I didn't go inside a whale. But I was almost into a collision on my car on the highway. Driving back one night. I was doing about 70 miles an hour. There's two lanes going this way, two lanes going that way. I was going this way. I was in the high-speed lane, and something told me, get in the other lane. When I did, I went around the bend. There was a car on the wrong side of the highway coming in the high-speed lane on my, my side. I would have had a head-on collision, and I would have probably died. But even when I was backslidden, God still spoke to me. Oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe God. If you're not right with God, he ain't going to speak to you. Abraham was in idolatry. Abraham was into idolatry. When God said, Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy father's house to a land that I will show you. He was an idol worshiper. God can talk to whoever he wants to. I'm sure God can speak to me if he speaks to a donkey. Hee-haw. He said, Wendy, how do you know me, Jesus? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw you. When you were in that alley, when you were at your friend's house, when you were at the shopping mall, when you were in the nightclub, when you were taking that alcoholic drink, when you had taken that drug, whatever it was, I saw you. <coughs> I saw you. Verse 49. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God. What a revelation. What a revelation. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You saw me? You were nowhere around. How did you know? How did you know? I was in that fig tree. Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. You have to understand these phraseologies. <coughs> Traffic jam. <coughs> That's what it sounds like in India. Everybody's blowing their horn all the time. Africa too, right? Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon. <laughs> Nathaniel answered unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. When you see these phraseology, you have to understand, there were generations after generations after generations after generations after generations that were waiting for the Messiah. 
There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years from the time of the Old Testament closing of the book of Malachi. Known as the intertestamental period. The 400 silent years. I preached a few weeks or months ago about that. Where there was no king in Israel. And here's little Nathaniel, a little nobody, in a city, in a tree, and now has the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel. When they heard those words, you have to understand, when a Jew hears those words, King of Israel, there's excitement. There's joy. Because now they'll have someone over them. The Bible said when there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the condition when there's no king in Israel. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. But now Nathaniel comes and he says, Thou art the king of Israel. Now you're going to bring order back out of disorder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to bring justice where there was injustice. You're going to bring righteousness where there was unrighteousness. You're going to be joy where there was sorrow. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. That's what it meant to hear the phrase, King of Israel. You can imagine little Nathaniel all excited. He didn't go, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the King of Israel. No, he had excitement in his voice. I believe it anyway. You can believe he was some dead fundamental evangelical if you want to. Verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, That's all well and good, Nathaniel. Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree. Believest thou? In other words, I had a word of knowledge and I gave it to you. Are you all excited about that? Something when God gives you a word of knowledge, it's something that you don't know anything about. And someone comes up to you and begins to point you out and tells you something of your heart. Or tells you something in your, in your family, tells you something's going on, whatever it may be. And you go, how did they know that? He says, you believe it because I said that to you, Nathaniel? Look at these, these words. Thou shalt see greater things than these. Greater things are yet to be done in this city. We haven't begun to see the things that God wants to do. Greater things shall you see than these. Hallelujah. What are some of the things that you're trusting God for? That's nothing compared to what God's going to do. Well, you don't know, Pastor. My, my situation is almost impossible. Oh, really? What did Lisa read this morning? Huh? Nothing, nothing is too hard for God. Are you hearing me? Your son is not too hard for God. Your daughter is not too hard for God. It's hard for you. Your brother is not too hard for God. He's coming. Don't be surprised. One day you invite him. He's going to say, I'm going with you. He will sit right there next to you. 
Say, oh, pastor, you're just, just funning me. No, I'm not just funning you. I got people here that will testify to you. I said the same thing to. And he was one of them. Waiting for Tom. You know, Tom was in his rebellious state and he was, had his long hair and he was busy in his garden on Sunday. But as he was cultivating that God and God was cultivating his heart. He wasn't here. And I used to tell Annie, Annie, pray, keep praying. He's coming. He's coming. And he came. And look at him. He hasn't left yet. Praise God. Don't you ever leave, Brother Tom. Greater things you shall see. Oh, you just believe a little word? He's the king of Israel. You're going to see greater things. Oh, yes, we see the United States is under tremendous, tremendous oppression. We've got a president that is an Islam, Muslim. And we see people being beheaded by ISIS. Things around the world looking dim. Spirit of lawlessness is running rapid. But I want you to know, hallelujah, that there is a little light that's going to shine. And we're going to let this little light shine no matter what happens. God made us a promise. He said, I will pour water on him that is thirsty. I hope you understand that these scriptures on the wall here <coughs> are not there by accident. Amen. I just didn't put them there to make use of something on the wall. I was researching revivals, and, and I really didn't think anything of it, and I came across a revival that came in Sweden. I believe it was Sweden. Two old ladies in their 80s, so don't ever think God can't use you. 80-something years old, praying. Guy's name is Duncan Campbell. Was a preacher, had his itinerary set for six months. That's why preachers, if you're hearing this message, don't set your itinerary so tight. And they prayed, and God says, go get D Duncan Campbell. Tell him to come. We're going to do some revival meetings. So they call for him, and he says, I'm sorry, I'm booked all the way to the end of the year. I can't come. The two ladies begin to pray. Before you know it, everything started canceling out of his book. Finally, he called them and said, I'm going to come, and he came. And they were years of revival. And this is the scripture that God gave to those two elderly women. And when I read that, it jumped in my spirit. I said, I'm going to put that on our wall. Because that promise is not just for that country. It's not just for those people. It's for us. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. The problem is we're not thirsty enough. We certainly have some dry grounds, but we don't see no floods. We don't see God's spirit on our kids. We don't see God's blessing on the offspring. Why? Because we're not thirsty. You will see greater things than these. I'm going to do a thing that's not new, but it's going to continue in the book of Acts. He said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Are we in the last days? He's going to pour it out, not sprinkle. He's going to pour it out. And I'm going to tell you right now, either you're going to get more godly or you're going to get more worldly. There's not going to be any more in between. God's looking for a few good men and women 
that will say, set me on fire, God. Set me on fire. I want the fire, God. Oh, I got the Holy Ghost. But I want to be set on fire. Next verse, please. First, Jesus says, because you recognize me as the king of kings, you, re you recognize me as the king of Israel and the Messiah, you're going to see greater things than these. And then he says this, Verily I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. God is going to send angels to fight the battles. See, the battle's not ours. We can't fight supernatural battles. Are you hearing? We're natural. If we were to see in the spiritual realm over the city of New Bedford, you would see demonic angels, fallen angels, that are influencing, that are pushing evil, pushing all of the sin and everything that degrades a, a, a city, you would see them. And in the natural, there's nothing you and I can do about it. What we have to do is be able to stand. The Bible says, having done all, stand. Stand with the armor of God on. <clears throat> Put on the armor of God. Stand in the evil day. Stand with the what? The sword of the what? Sword of the spirit, which is what? Nobody knows that? Come on. The word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. What comes out of your mouth? Doubt, unbelief. I don't think you're going to do this, God. How can this happen? I don't understand. Why it's taking so long, God? How come, uh, how come God, uh, this, how come this and how come that and blah, 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 blah. God's saying, wait a minute. Did I call you to be a complainer? Or did I call you to be a champion? Did I call you to be the tail? Or did I call you to be the head? What did I call you to? I called you to fight. But fight in this way. Stand firm. And begin to pray and ask God to send his warring angels in this city to fight back the forces of darkness. Begin to pray and ask God to send his angels for your protection. Begin to ask God to send the angels to destroy the works of lawlessness in this city. And push it back. <coughs> so that you and I can evangelize. <clears throat> it's good to pass out tracts. But are you praying first? Am I praying first? Pray first. <coughs> In China, there was a group that went, what they did was they got a city of the, they got a map of their city. And this may help. And they took a block where they felt the Lord was targeting them to go. And they took a block in the city, maybe five, six blocks. And they, block, they, they penciled it out on the map. And every day they came together at church, they would pray over that particular block. Now, China's communist. Want to talk about deep darkness? You can't own a Bible in inland China. If you're caught with a Bible and it's not part of the governmental church, two years in prison. What you brought today, if you were caught, would be two years in prison. And they would pray over this block every time they'd have a service. You know how long they prayed? Five years. Hello? Five years they prayed over that 
four or five blocks they stayed mapped out. And after five years, God said, now go. You're not going to believe me when I tell you. 96% of that block came to Christ. That's phenomenal. We say, but whoa, we'd be blessed if we got 20%. They got 96%. In a communist country with such darkness, and here in America, we're not arrested for our faith, we're not arrested or persecuted, sort of. And yet we hold back. God wants to bless us. God wants to deliver us. <clears throat> Look at Psalm 23 for a moment. Everybody knows Psalm 23. Let me read it, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. This is a big problem in America. People don't want to follow. They don't want to follow. Well, you know, there's, you know they're like Israel. There's no king in Israel, so there's no king. Jesus ain't here, so I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Here's the part America doesn't like in the, U in the U.S. church. I shall not want. We in American church, we want, want this, want that, want prosperity. We want houses, bigger houses, bigger cars. We want all that other stuff. <clears throat> it's not wrong to have it. But when it compares to God and it compares to Jesus and it compares to him being your savior, all that's going to burn. It's all going to burn. You can't take it with you. Even Solomon, who was the richest man in the world, said it's all vanity. It's all vain. It means nothing. Verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Wow. You ever been somewhere where you've been so, so at peace, you just, you just relax? That happened to me the other day. We were painting over there, and, <clears throat> and I just, my arms got tired because you know, we're rolling and stuff, and, I, and I'm not feeling good. So I, I said, I'm just going to sit down a minute. And I kind of sat on the platform. We have a platform over there, you know. I kind of sat on the platform, and I, I laid back like this. And I went out like a light. Bob said I slept for about an hour. And I just kind of like woke up. I guess I was snoring or whatever. It woke me up. But I laid down in green pastures. There was such peace. He leads me beside still waters. Why doesn't he, why doesn't he lead us between, between... Why doesn't he lead us beside... The rough waters. Why doesn't he lead us to the monstrous waves and the crashing of waves? Why doesn't he lead us there? Why the still waters? Anybody got an idea? It's more calm. One thing about the calm waters, it brings a true reflection. and see who he really is. You know, everybody likes the, the fire, you know, and the waves roaring. And say, so God, are you in the fire? No. Are you in the flood? No. But in a still small voice. <coughs> Sometimes people say, I wish God would speak to me. How many ever said that?
You know what happens when your cable gets unplugged a little bit from your TV, you get all snow and static? That means the signal's still there, cable's still there, but you're not getting the reception. Can I tell you, there are some of you here today, this morning, God's been speaking to you through this message, but you don't hear him. 